Church, we believe this. Whatever he sets out to do, he will accomplish. Who can stop the Lord? Let's sing. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the light. The world is the grace of chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Amen. Come on, church. Let's lift up our praise today. Aren't you thankful that we get together every week for worship, you know? And you know, when we gather together for corporate worship, we're not just here checking things off of a box. We're here today to really worship and engage with God, to draw near to Him as He draws near to us. Several months ago, God laid on my heart that, you know, we've gone through a, a really crazy year and a half, and something that we really need as a church is a night of worship. And so in a few weeks on November the 14th, we're gonna gather in this room at 6.30 p.m. and we're gonna worship and we're gonna pray and we're gonna walk through the scriptures and we're expecting God to do a great thing. And so as we do that, as we prepare for that night, let's not neglect this morning as well. Let's make sure that we are drawing near to God and we're singing and we're mentally and spiritually preparing for that night of worship. So let's continue to sing and lift up to the Lamb of God. Great I am, a cross. 
crown of thorns upon his head. The Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we curse your name. church. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign for just a moment. What a wonderful way to start this service. You were truly engaged. I love that when you do that. This is uh, Cancer Awareness Sunday. And uh, on this Sunday, we recognize and we realize the things that people have gone through that have fought cancer, not only through this past year, but also in years past. 
Cancer is a devastating disease. It's an absolutely horrible demon that can wreck the lives of so many. But also I wanna today thank God for the numbers of us who are walking testimonies that cancer can be beaten and the fact that we can have victory over that. Amen? All you survivors, I want all the cancer survivors to stand up. If you're a cancer survivor, stand up with me. I wanna show you something right here, all right? We praise God for that. We thank God for that. Go ahead and have a seat. I'm gonna tell you something. God's not through blessing. Everybody had a good week? Had a great week, Pastor. Okay. You might have said amen right there. Amen. Okay. I wanna. Everybody had a great week? I'm gonna tell you, God is good. If you haven't found that out yet, you need to look a little more. But I, I know that God is blessing so many people. Now I'm gonna tell you, if you're here today and you are fighting cancer, you're battling cancer, there is a group that we have in our church, our cancer support group, our cancer care group, and they are an amazing group of people. Most of them have fought cancer before or family members of those individuals who meet together on about a monthly basis. They have different people come in and talk about treatments that are going on. They discuss uh, ways that caregivers can be supported. Uh, they do a lot of work. And if you're a cancer, if right now, if you presently have cancer, I'm gonna invite you, if you would, to stop by the guest services desk and let us know so we can get you on our prayer list and let them minister to you. A great group of people. I thank God for the number of you that each time someone is afflicted by that dreaded disease, you rise up, you don't just send them cards, you start bringing food over, you check on whether they need travel, you help them with their treatment to follow up. And I, I just can't be uh, grateful enough for the number of you that, that serve in that capacity. Sadly today, I share with you that the pastor's wife of the Parker County Cowboy Church, Penny Sneed, lost her battle to cancer uh, this week. And, and she passed away. Just two weeks ago, he lost his brother. And so for that sister church and for what they're going through today, we, we lift them up as well. Out there uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the foyer are two prayer quilts. These are two very special people. These are two very, very uh, faithful people. Nora Boardman, and, and she's praying that her recent back surgery will be successful. And she just needs that knot tied. So when it's laid over her, she can know the prayers of the people. And then Pat Gosney, Pat has fought and fought and fought in recent, about a month or more, uh, something that's going on. They're trying to figure out this illness that's kept her in the hospital for two months. And she just wants to go home. She just wants to be able to find out what this is and get back home. And I know you can do that. I'm grateful to Richard and Joan Rockwell for, again, uh, paying the monies to be able to support our radio broadcast. You maybe want to do that to make sure it goes out uh, from our church every, every Sunday morning. But right now, I want, to, I want to pray for you. Today, as we address not only the cancer issue, but the COVID issue and a lot of the other issues that, that people are facing, I'm going to try to share with you some ways that you personally can fight back. No one can solve your problems for you. You say, oh, I know some people that if they just leave, my problem would be solved. Well, I know that's part, but you still got a problem, all right? Because most of our problems are, are on the inside. Most of our problems are things that we have to battle. And today, I'm gonna give you some tools so that you can learn how to battle on your own. And I pray God will use this. I pray God will bless uh, this service time together. In your spirit, not your head, prayers are set up here. Praying's done down here, okay? We can say prayers up here. You pray down here, you pray in your spirit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little time here to disconnect yourself from all the stuff that's going on and let God get to the center of you. 
Whatever's happening in your family and in your life, good or bad, I know that God's in control. And you may fight it. You may not wanna be exactly where he wants you to be, but God's gonna win, so you might as well give it up. But I'm gonna ask you right now to just open your hands and let go. Open your hands, open your heart, and let God have whatever it is. God, inside of us, there are so many things, so many ideas, so many dreams, so many things that we worry about that are wrong, not only in us, but in the lives of others we live with. I thank you for all the relationships you've given to us. They're such a blessing. And I pray for the relationships that have gone wrong that we feel the pain from. I pray for healing on the inside. I pray for wisdom on the outside. I pray for courage in the midst of the battles that many of these are facing who are fighting cancer and other diseases. I pray today for those that are undergoing tests and being probed and punched and prodded. And I just pray that you'll use those doctors and nurses, but God, you're the healer. You're the all powerful healer. You're the one who on the cross, we laid down our sickness as well as our sin. And you're the one that can bring that healing to us. God, help us to be honest today that where the wounds are, we'll be willing to treat them. In Jesus' name, amen. Brett, amen. you got Thanks, one Pastor. more? Yeah, as we continue to sing, as we continue to worship, we're gonna prepare our hearts for pastor's message. And so we're gonna ask you to stand up again today, this morning as we make that connection in worship, whatever God is asking us to do, let's just say, yes, I will. We're gonna lift his name up, things are rough. We're gonna lift him, his name up here in this room. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the way the same god who's never late is working all things out working all things out yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name always count on God. He's never going to let us down. Amen. Let's sing that truth together. Count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will 
Yes, I will. Amen, church. Let's give him praise today. You can be seated. Psalm 56, got your Bibles, your phones, your iPads, whatever it is. I want you to take a look over at that Psalm today because it's gonna be a great support for your life and mine. Now, while you're turning there, I want you to say something with me. Jesus is Lord. That's what I thought I'd get back. Now, would you confess with authority, Jesus is Lord. That's where we start. That's where we start. Jesus is Lord, therefore he is the one who is going to be able to overcome and beat back anything that comes against us. But we have a role in his healing and we have a role in his authority and his power over us. Psalm 56 is one that I've grown to love and you're gonna find as we go through it, it's got some powerful things to say about the way God ministers to us. While today we, we talk about the people fighting against cancer and those caregivers and, and all the things they've been through. I know the words cancer and when they come towards you. I've known it three times. I, I know the immediate response of kind of like, wow. There's a kind of a pause and then there's a fear that follows and then, then there's a, the questions and then there's the searching and then there's the treatment and then all that that goes with it. And when people fight that battle, we shouldn't have to fight it alone because people understand when we have cancer. Sometimes though our problem's not cancer of the body, it's cancer of the soul or it's cancer of the spirit. And we're not as quick to confess, I've got a deep wound in my soul. And people don't wanna hear that because they don't know what to do when they, they hear it. There's a lot of other diseases we've learned to fight in here. We had the great demonstration of how diabetes can be helped out when someone can give a kidney. There's some that have lost loved ones and are trying to fill the hole in their life. They're trying to figure out what to do with the future and how they're gonna afford it. Some that have been through divorce and others that have, have been through the loss of children in some way, all of them searching for ways to deal with the pain in their life and the changes in their lifestyle. There's a lot of people facing business problems right now. Some of you I know have made a choice and I don't fault you on that choice when you say, I don't think I'm gonna take that shot. That's your choice. I believe in that choice. And yet it may be costing you in some way. If anybody's in here that's not fighting a problem, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> the Swedes had a statement, life is hard. And if it's not, it should be. Because when we challenge life, life fights back. Where do you go when life's being tormented by so many enemies? Where do you go whenever more than one thing's happening? In Psalm three, he says, he says Lord, the, my enemies have multiplied. Isn't it the way it goes? You get one problem, you got three. You don't ever fight one problem in your life. There's multiplied enemies. 56, Psalm 56, verse one. Be gracious to me, God, for a man is trampling me. He fights and oppresses me all day long. My adversaries trample me all day for many arrogantly fight against me. Whenever you read in the Old Testament about a single battle, a man fighting a battle against the Philistines, against the family member, 
against uh, other trials in life that might come, enemies that are coming in. You can switch that over to understand he's talking about the same stuff that happens to us. My enemy may not be called Philistine. My enemy may not be called sons that come against you like David. But each one of us has those enemies that are attacking us. Why do I know that? Because Satan never leaves a believer alone. Satan never leaves a believer alone. He's always trying to steal your joy, your peace, your security. He's trying to take away your life. You're gonna see in this Psalm the fluctuations of David. Faith and then desperation. Faith and then trouble. The fluctuations of courage and faith characterize the devout soul. You say, well, if I'm a real believer, I, I shouldn't have those times of depression. Well, you're, yes, you're gonna see that today. There's nothing wrong with having a problem in your life, having a, a, a fear in your heart. That's a thing that happens to all of us. That's where our God comes in. First, fear and faith coexist. I've said this verse so many times. I love this verse. This is the verse that has carried me through so much. When I am afraid, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. Wait a minute, you just said what time I'm afraid. Now you're saying I will not be afraid. No, no, he's saying when my fear matches my faith, I gotta ask you, does it take a calamity to turn us to God? Is the only time America's gonna come back to God is when it's threatened again? Is the only time when we're gonna be smart enough to recognize we're not big enough to handle this world without the God who made us and the God who loves us and the God who wants to guide us? What is it gonna take to get us back to God? We don't know precisely what the, the, the psalmist was talking about. It certainly wasn't a pleasant life when he says, they oppress me, enemies trample on me, they lurk and watch for my steps, their thoughts are against me for evil. I've had people like that in my life. I've had people in, that my, in my life off and on. I mean, you know, I, people get mad at me. I, I, I have a quiet, still, simple personality. <laughs> it offends no one. I, the words I use are, for, you're saying move on, is that what you're saying? <laughs> you don't want the lightning to hit right here, move back, okay. No, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a confronting, I, you know, I, man, I, I live at large. I live at large and therefore I don't have little problems. I mean, I don't just make people a little mad, I tick them off, right? And, and then I, you know, it's always, I, I, I have to spend my time trying to regroup and come back. You know, I just didn't mean it that way. Occasionally I'll use sarcasm. Uh, maybe once or twice I'll, I'll use that. And, and it gets me into trouble. No. Yeah, we get problems. I'm gonna tell you how faith and fear coexist. My, my son, Robbie, we, we, were, we were blessed to have him. By the way, this is also our month for Infertility Awareness Month. And Infertility Awareness Month causes us to recognize those who have desperately desired to be able to have a child. And many that have gone through miscarriage after miscarriage, those that have suffered through that and, and even to stillbirth. And we, we, we understand that. And, and Brittany uh, uh, really works hard with, with the group to be able to identify with that. And if you've got that issue, you'll find a booth out there to talk to him. But we, we were able to be blessed with Robbie. And uh, right after his birth, he began to have problems. He, uh, you know, it seemed like he just could not settle down. And he'd go forever. He'd just cry and he'd wail. He'd throw his arms back. And then finally it got to the place he started seizing. And I'll never forget the night when he was in my arms and he just locked back and quit breathing. Just locked back. And I immediately grabbed him up and we ran to the car and we got to Cook's Hospital and we put him in. And while he was there in the hospital, I, my wife stayed with him and I went back to work. And I got a call from my wife and she says, you need to come 
They think he has, and she named the name of the disease. And they think that he may not be able to raise his arms for very long, and he may not be able to, it could be from that to where he can't throw a ball or, or something, but he's in trouble. And I started driving to Fort Worth out of Burleson. Man of faith, man who believes in God to answer every prayer, man of courage, man who's preached it all. I'm driving down the road filled with faith and crying my eyes out. Crying so hard, I had to pull off the road. Does that mean I didn't have faith? No, it meant I had to get my faith up to my fear and take charge of it. They coexist. When you are in a time of trouble, the trouble doesn't go away. And it requires that you maintain that level of faith to counter that fear. This one brief verse, the brevity just shows us the singer's fear and how he silences it by the dead lift of effort by which he constrains himself to believe. Faith doesn't come without effort. You don't just naturally, easily believe to match a, a horrible trial in your life. You have to find that faith and you've got to lift that faith. You've got to hold that faith if you're gonna know strength. One, the one antagonist of fear is faith. Trust, however, is a voluntary action for which we're responsible. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the what? Word of God. And so you dig into the word. But the issue is, trust is your responsibility. There is no, if there's no fear, there's little trust, they coexist. But when we focus on the problem of the physical level, the visible facts supply the heart with an abundant case of fear. If you keep looking at the problem, you're not going to come to the solution because it just builds in your heart. But it rests with us whether we will yield to the things we see or turn our eyes toward a God who is all powerful and a God who will bring peace to you, not tomorrow, not in a little while, but right now. Amen. Are you with me here? It's on us. It's there. We have little power of directly controlling fear or any other feeling. Our feelings just happen. But we can determine the objects on which we fix our attention. You can't stop being afraid if there's a snake there. Oh, I have great faith. I have no problem with that rattlesnake. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Truth of the matter is we have those things that bring that in our limited strength and our limited knowledge and our limited vision. The things that challenge us are often a lot greater. Some things are out of our control. People aren't gonna listen to us. We can't get into to be able to solve those problems. I've said this to you so many times. Your strength, one of these days we're gonna start quoting it. Your strength is directly related to your faith and your faith is directly related to your knowledge of God and your willingness to trust in him. Put the tag on there now. And your willingness to trust in him. If we choose to look at man, we'll be foolish. If we choose to look at man, we'll be foolish if we don't fear. If we choose to look at God, it would be more foolish if we didn't trust. How can you not, how can you not believe when you truly see the almighty, all powerful, all giving God? When your eyes rest on him and his power and his beauty and his magnificence, when you see him upon the throne, you recognize his presence where you are, we would be foolish 
not to believe he was bigger than the problem. But we wrestle on the earth. I want to talk to you here about some principles of healing. I hope this works for you. I've thought about this for years. God works in principles. The least shall be first. The, the chosen ones are the ones that God uses. I want you to capture one verse and see what it means. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. I don't know whether you've ever stood in a mirror and said that or not. You say, how vain is that? No, no, it's not vanity. It's to look upon that and to say, God, you have a purpose. You made me. How wonderful are your works. I'm going to accept that I'm somebody. I'm going to accept that this is not a mistake that I'm not less than anyone else. When you look in that mirror and you say, God, how wonderful are your works. We say that and we're looking at other people. Get in the mirror. You're special too. You're unique in all creation. You know, the impact of a major illness or circumstances that affect a single individual also affect a lot of other people. Nobody has cancer, but a spouse doesn't care. Nobody goes through heart struggles and difficulties and has a heart attack and family members don't come and friends aren't deeply in, uh, impacted. Trauma of any kind wounds an individual and creates the need for healing. Whatever that trauma is, it creates a need for healing. Now, we've recognized from those that I've dealt with and others that are dealing with PTSD, that that's a wound. They received a wound and it occurred maybe in battle as they were dealing with that, but there's other battles in life where people suffer PTSD. They never get over something that happens to them and we don't see it because they weren't wearing a uniform. It was in another situation I understand a plane crashed out here on, on, on 20 yesterday. One of our young men went, rushed to the scene of that and pulled those people out of that plane. And I thank God for him, amen? The truth of the matter is, that picture's not gonna leave his mind. He's gonna have to deal with the thoughts he had and what went on when he rushed into that place. Sometimes the battleground of life leaves many individuals struggling to move forward because they're trapped by an incident that happened before them. Everything that they try to do to get it out of their mind won't do it, and they're stuck. These individuals need to find a way to heal their wounds. What, 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 what can you do to heal an emotional wound, a betrayal a wound of bitterness. You see, God has principles that apply across the three parts of our lives, body, soul, and spirit. And we can receive wounds to all three of those areas. We know about the physical wound, but what about the emotional wound? What about the one you're carrying because right now you're living in the house but you hate your wife? You say, oh preacher, that doesn't happen. Huh, yeah. How about the one that you carry because your son hates you? How about the one you're carrying because you trusted? How about the one because of the loss you had and the grief you're feeling? What about the wound that's there? Now here's what I want you to recognize. Let's look at the steps to heal a physical wound. This is not something I think is gonna, you're gonna say, well, everybody knows that. Everybody understands that. What do you have to do? Well, first you have to recognize the severity of the wound. If you scratch yourself walking by something and you look down and, 
and you see maybe that you're bleeding, you get as old as I have, you have cuts all over you, you never know what happened. You know, your skin just breaks loose, doesn't it, Nick? It's just, you know, it's just one of those things. But, but you look at it and you go, well, that, that's a scratch. I'm going to wash it off. I'm going to kind of put a little something on it. It'll be fine. But if that scratch isn't protected, if you don't do something to deal with that scratch, it can develop an infection, can't it? And all of a sudden, it's not healing. It's going the other way. It's eating into the skin. If you don't deal with it, you're going to pay for it. Sometimes the wound is a, is a whole lot worse. Sometimes it's a gash and it's deep. And you got to figure out what you're going to do to deal with it. Well, you see the cut, you saw it in your child. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, number one, you're going to stop the bleeding. You're, you're going to try to get the bleeding stopped because if it has injured something that a lot of blood's coming out, the loss of that blood could be more damaging than the cut. You apply bandages before you stop the bleeding all you're going to do is create a festering place for more problems. You don't throw a bandage, a bandage over a, a major wound while it's bleeding out and just keep putting more band-aids on it and say, well, this ought to, it's okay. We'll just keep covering it up. Covering it up. Covering it up. Wounds don't heal when you just cover them up. Then you protect the, or you cleanse the wound. And boy, that's not pleasant, is it? It's not pleasant whenever I've got a, I've got a heart on my knee. Some people say they think that's where it is. It's down on my shin down there. I've got a heart-shaped place where I was slung into a tetherball pole with my leg straight out. And, and it bruised that flesh so bad it never came back really. It's just a large scar. And I remember when they were cleaning it out and I wanted to go, just let me go throw my leg against the tetherball pole again. It'd be better than you using that brush. Why are you doing that? You're scrubbing my wound. You're scrubbing my flesh and it hurts. Oh, let's pour some alcohol in there and see how he likes that. What are you doing? We're cleansing this wound because if you don't get it cleaned, it's gonna hurt and be worse than the wound itself. They protect the wound. They cover the wound. They, they try to rest it. If you hurt something, if you pull something, you have to rest it. You can't, can't use it. <laughs> Biggest thing is don't pick at it. You keep picking at it, what are you gonna do? It's not gonna heal. You're gonna keep picking at it, picking at it, picking at it. Now you've got the top of it opened up and those little skin cells that had covered the top that are waiting the bottom to heal back, they can't get their job done because you got the top all messed up. It's not gonna heal. And then you gotta treat the wound until it's healed. You can't just do it one time. Well, put a bandage on it. About two weeks later, we'll take that bandage off. Woo, I don't wanna be around. I don't wanna, no, you gotta, you gotta give attention to it. You gotta keep your attention on it. You gotta keep checking on it. How's it doing? How's it healing? A little bit of a cover comes over the top, but the real healing is down on the bottom where the collagen begins to fill in and the cells begin to knit, knit deeper. Cause you gotta realize something. Wounds heal from the inside out. Wounds heal from the inside out. You can, you can cover the top of it, but what's going on is deeper than that. And it's something that is that part of being fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, well, I know that preacher. I know how to handle a cut. I've dealt with my kids. We watch them, we keep them cleaned out. We do all that. Well, how do we deal with soul or emotional or spiritual wounds? A soul wound is an emotional wound. Your soul is your personality. Your soul are your emotions. Your spirit is the eternal part of you that belongs to God. How do you deal with that? An emotional wound might be as deep as a root of bitterness. An emotional wound might be a feeling of betrayal or abuse. Or it may be as small as a hurt feeling or a sadness you have. But you know that emotional wounds can really mess up your life. 
and emotional wounds untreated can destroy your life. Truth of the matter is we have so many people that are carrying around wounds, wounds that they may have gotten as a child, wounds that they may have had uh, even years ago, and those wounds are still deep. All they've tried to do is throw something on top. A spiritual wound is caused by Satan's attack. It's where the enemy has gotten a spear through and you sin. And now then it's, it leads to a hindered relationship with God. And right now, every time you start to pray, God says, are we going to deal with that gambling issue? Uh, God, thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Hey, the gambling issue. Well, and thank you for all the blessings of life. Hey, how about the pornography, dude? You're going to talk to me about that? Well, God, I thank you for the fact that you've given me. And we just keep covering the wound. It's sin. Or let's look at the steps to heal a soul wound. Well, what are you going to do? Here's the beautiful part, folks. If you want to heal a wound inside of you, just like uh, you do it just like you did the uh, outside. How am I going to heal the wound that's on the inside of me? If you know how to fix a cut, you can know how to fix your soul. Recognize the severity of the wound. So number one, acknowledge that you're hurting. Admit you've got a problem. You can often identify the depth of a soul wound a wound of the soul by how much it consumes your thoughts. You can't quit thinking about what your dad did to you. You can't quit thinking about what your wife did. You can't quit thinking about what, what whoever it was did. You can't quit thinking about how you got hurt. It stays on your mind. And let me tell you something, it will become the Lord of your life. How that reacts and how that responds will determine whether you're happy or sad. It'll determine whether you have joy or whether you act in anger. It will bring out all kinds of things. Now, this may be an irrational fear. It may be a false guilt. Satan loves to use irrational fear. He loves to take fear and make it take something and cause you to fear it so much and you have no control over it and you keep looking at it instead of looking to God. The more you look at it, the more you get focused on it, the more it begins to consume you and it begins to eat into your life a false guilt about something. And Satan loves to use guilt, whether it's false guilt or real guilt, and bring one thing to you that should never be in your life, and that is shame. God does not shame us. Because to shame someone is to make them worthless. And God sees value in every person. And he may bring guilt upon you, but he will not bring shame because he wants to restore you. Whether a person or a circumstance, a soul wound can wreak havoc on your life. You just won't let go of it. <laughs> you, know, you know how we do it. Well, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, it's okay. No, it, it's okay. It's not a problem. <laughs> That's that emotional Band-Aid. You're throwing something over it thinking, well, I'll just leave this alone and it'll go away. No, it won't. No, it won't. This is Satan's attack, my friend. This is a wound. And you better understand he's going to use that wound to dig deep. Well, what's the first thing you need to do? Stop the bleeding. Admit that you need to quit thinking about it and talking about it. You can't ignore a soul wound by masking. You've got to answer the cry of your soul. You can't mask it. You can't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, how come you're still thinking about it? It's, it's not a problem. Well, then how come you're so involved and invested in it still? Stop the bleeding. Recognize I've got to quit focusing on that. 
What else do I do? Well, the truth of the matter is you got to cleanse that wound. I'm going to tell you something. That's, that's, the, that's the hardest part. <laughs> because you know what you got to do? You got to start talking. You've got to admit it. You've got to dig deep into it and say how bad it's affecting you. You've got to deal with it. You don't want to deal with it. That's why you buried it so far. You don't want to bring it up, but you are bringing it up. <laughs> I don't want to think about it, but you are thinking about it. Listen to what happened to David. I was speechless and quiet. I kept silent even from speaking good and my pain intensified. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. And then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, let me know what's going on and what's the extent of my days. Tell me how transient I am. God, God help me. Help me understand this course. Help me get a hold and handle on this. For whatever his problem was, it's the same thing for you. Now, men, I'm, I know women are sitting here going, boy, he's talking to the men today. All those guys think they're so tough. They don't need to work it out. They don't need to talk it out. Let me tell you what that wound becomes. It becomes what you inflict on your family. It becomes what you inflict on somebody else. It becomes the overreaction of your life in a given area. When you don't deal with that, you begin to take it out on everybody. Anybody with me here today? I'd like one or two of those along the way. You see, honesty about our feeling releases many stressors. If you just get honest about it, all of a sudden you're gonna find out I feel a little better. It's amazing when the words come out your mouth and go through your own ears, you realize how crazy you are. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> you think, I got a great idea, I got a great idea. And you walk in and start to tell your boss and you go, boy, that's stupid. Because all of a sudden it starts working through. And when you got a real pain in your life and it's a really hard pain, you walk in and you're talking to the counselor and then you go, why am I crying? You're crying because for the first time your ears heard what your heart's been feeling. You're crying because it's, oh my goodness, there's no way I'm gonna get through this. All right, we gotta go. Emotional wounds in, in untreated lead to damage in life as anger turns to hate, hate to bitterness, and many get hurt. What else you gotta do? You gotta protect the wound. You've gotta protect the wound. You gotta create boundaries, keep the people away. Boundaries to keep the wound from being opened or, or damaged more. You gotta change the way you think so that your soul can rejoice. And then you've gotta treat the wound until it's healed. You gotta treat it until it's healed. You've got to learn not only the power of forgiveness but the power of faith. You've got to understand that you can't just touch it Close the door and walk away. If you're gonna be whole and you're gonna be free, you gotta deal with it. But especially you've gotta realize that that wound has to heal from the inside out and masking your pain will never resolve your wound. Staying quiet about it, pouting about it, ruminating about it is not gonna solve your problem. All right, quickly. How do you heal a spiritual wound? It's the same thing. The first thing you do is you realize the severity of the wound. Your sin is destroying your life. You know how you define addiction? There's something I do that causes damage in my life and I keep doing it over and over. Why do you keep doing something that keeps damaging your life over and over? Because it's an addiction. It's a weakness. You've got to admit the severity of that wound. It's either costing you in one area of your life or other. Is this a one-time ethical failure or is it a moral character failure? Is this something that I've become or is this something I just did that I need to ask God to forgive me because it stays on my mind? Is it the sin that easily besets? Then you gotta take action to stop the bleeding. How am I gonna stop the bleeding? 
I can't get over this. I'm addicted to it. I'm controlled by it. I'm falling victim to it. My sin is eating me up. I'm afraid to tell anybody. It's brought, it's brought guilt in my life and I'm shaming myself. How do you do that? Admit more than you're a sinner. Admit the sin. It's pretty easy. Well, we're all sinners. Yeah, we're all sinners. Why don't you just shout out loud what yours is? Oh, no. No, 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 I can't, I wouldn't do that. I mean, people, would. oh, I'd be so embarrassed, I'd be so hurt. Admit the sin. Then you gotta cleanse the wound. How are you gonna cleanse the wound? That's the same steps. I, 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 I've, I've recognized it, I, I've, I've admitted it. Only confession and repentance purge the heart and make you clean before God. That's all that's gonna do it. David, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're justified when you speak, blameless when you judge. Oh God, I confess, I'm trapped. I'm trapped. You gotta protect the wound. Let me tell you, sin is seldom done in isolation. You know what that means? Change your friends. Change where you're going. Figure out what it is that you do when you get to a certain place or when you do a certain thing. So much of the marriage counseling that I do, I ask the one question, where are you drinking? Yeah. Duh. I mean, we might check that first. Beware of Satan's use of your weakness. Each one is tempted and drawn aside by their own lust. Lust turns to sin and sin to death. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin's accomplished, it brings forth death. Don't be an idiot. That sin is gonna tear up your life. Lastly, treat the word, the the pain until it's healed. If we say that we don't have any sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth's not in us. But if we'll just confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You see, sin can be forgiven in a single act. But sanctification, that takes a lot more. Sanctification takes a lot more. All right, let's close this out. Let's go back to Psalm 56. You're back to your Bible, Psalm 56, eight. You've kept count of my tossings. You put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God is aware of every need you have. God is aware of every need you have. Even things that you don't even recognize you need, he is aware of. I hear people say, nobody understands. God understands. Isn't that beautiful? You've kept count of my tossings. You've watched me in that bed while I've wrestled with all this stuff. And you've taken my tears that I've poured out over this and you've kept them in that bottle. Your compassion is poured out. You're gonna remember not only that I hurt then, but you're gonna remember all the things that I've hurt from. When I know that God knows, there's nothing else I need to know. When I know that God knows, there's nothing else I need to know. He goes on and says, then my enemies are gonna turn back when I call and this I know, this I know. Hang on folks, here it comes. This I know that God is for me. It's all I need to know. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I've put my trust. I'm not gonna be afraid. What's man, mere man going to do to me? Closes out the whole chapter in verse 12 and 13, or, or close, states, your vow, I'm gonna render offerings to you. You've delivered my soul from death. You've kept my feet from stumbling. Now I can walk in front of you free in the light of your living. So what do we learn from the whole thing? Every fear about the circumstances of, uh, of, the, of life and our future are destroyed when our vision is focused on the God of love and compassion. 
Amen. While I'm talking about this today, God's been saying, you know what he's talking about. Hey, you know what he's talking about. You know about that. You know what's going on inside you. You know how much you're angry. You know how much you're, you won't tell anybody. You know about what's going on with the sin in your life. You know what's trapped in that. You know you're addicted to that. You know you're being weakened by that. You know you're nearly caught with that. You know your family's going to be so upset and they're going to feel so guilty if you get caught with that. What are you going to do with it? I open up God's hospital right now. God's hospital's right down here. Counselors will be here. You don't need them. You can go straight to those aisles because you know how to heal yourself. You know what you need to do. Let's stand together. God, I pray for an openness in this auditorium right now that would cause us to find real peace, real joy, real comfort. I pray that you would set us free, not only with the things that have happened physically to us, but with the pain of our soul. Would you do that right now? Oh God, I call on you in Jesus' name, amen. Do it right now, come.
one and come to the place where you go, okay, I'm gonna admit it. And now I've admitted it. Don't forget the next steps, amen? Don't forget the next steps. You gotta, you gotta cleanse it. You gotta work on it and let God set you free. Amen. You be seen. Brother Brad, do you have uh, the announcements? Do I have the announcements? I guess I, I have no announcements except trunk or treat is tonight. Well, and I got that. If you haven't signed your car up, but you still want to be involved, I think there's still room. You don't oh. know, you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> Well, look who just woke that's up, That's the way I live my life as pastor. I just don't know. That's I'm what I glad Sam's here. I'm teasing, Brad. I'm teasing. You're absolutely right. Trunk or Treat is tonight, 6328. You want to be there. This is one of the largest outreaches that we have for the community that is around us. You want to be here for that. Also, Agape Dinner is back on this year. I love Agape Dinner. It's a church-wide dinner where we review the year and we just celebrate the victories that God has given us. That uh, is going to be November 20th and 21st. That's a Saturday and a Sunday, and the tickets go on sale today. You can get them in guest services, and seating is limited, so you want to do that as quick as you can. Uh, also, uh, the last women's ministry workshop is next Sunday evening, and it's on the topic of kindness. There's going to be food, there's going to be fellowship, and Austin Cooper will be here to share practical ways to show kindness. Also next, uh, next week, next Sunday morning in the gym, between this service and the 11 o'clock service, Pastor Jim is going to have a mission fair set up in the gym. So you're going to want to stop by there, find ways that you can plug in, ways that you can get involved here in the church. And uh, last but not least, from my list, uh, we have two new members I want to recognize. Uh, Garrett and Ruth Linscombe. Where are you guys? Are you here this morning? Wave at me. All right. Well, they're new members. They came by way of transfer from the Village Church in Fort Worth. And if you're glad to have them as members, uh, let, let me know and let everybody else know by saying amen. amen. All right, we have a video we're going to show. And at the end of the video, you guys will be dismissed to go. Thank you and God bless. Hey, it's Brad Martin here and I am with Carl the Alpaca. Carl, it is Operation Christmas Child Time. Have you started packing your boxes yet? Um, I'm actually a llama. I just play an alpaca on TV. Hmm. So, uh, Carl, um, you know, it's a, a great opportunity to start, you know, packing and, and getting uh, supplies for your boxes. Um, you know, are you excited about Operation Christmas Child? Well, I'm good at packing, but I'm not so good at planning. How do I get started? Well, f that great question. First, don't run away because I've got some important information to tell you. What you need to do is gather with some of your alpaca friends and buy supplies and have an alpaca packing party. And you can uh, put some things together for all the kids. And hey, if you've got questions, what I want to encourage you to do is stop by guest services uh, at our Operation Christmas Child uh, desk and look for some of Carl's alpaca friends. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be a great, great season. So, uh, Carl, um, do you want to see some more of your uh, alpaca friends? Yeah, I'm a llama. Okay, and he's gone. Thank <laughs> you.